Hello everybody, this is James dealing with Daily Effects. Just wanted to do a quick sound check, so if you hear my voice, please type in a Y. As soon as we have confirmation on the audiovisual front, we'll get this session started. All right, beautiful. I already see a lot of Ys coming through. A lot of familiar faces. Hey Gary, good to see you. Arthur, Peter, Hasham. Oh man, so many, uh, too many to list, but everybody uh, in the room today, I just want to say thank you very much for your time in advance. Um, I was out of the office last week, came back, and we have a fairly chalked economic schedule for this week. Uh, the big part of that started this morning with uh, Chair Yellen's uh, twice annual Humphrey Hawkins testimony in front of Congress. And you've probably already seen some U.S. dollar movement today around that theme. Uh, so that's what we're going to look at. That's what we're going to focus on because it appears as though we might be nearing an, a very interesting juncture here on the greenback. Um, you know, take it in context of that second half of Q4 run, the January retracement. So far in February, it looks like quite a bit of strength is showing back up in the dollar. So today, we're going to look at USD price action setups with the goal of uh, finding something on either direction. Whether this dollar strength trend continues, we're going to have a couple of options to that. If, if it turns over, we go back into that bearish price action like we saw in January. Well, I want to have something to play there too. Uh, but before we get to any setups, I want to go through a couple of quick customers. I'm going to leave each up for about 15 seconds. As always, this session is about you. So feel free to type in whatever trading related questions that you have. And I will do my absolute best to answer them while we're right here on the webinar. And of course, if I can't answer them on the webinar, I'll be available on Twitter later. And then I do have another webinar on Thursday where I'll be happy to tie up matters. Uh, so without further ado, let's get to those risk disclaimers. Then we're going to get right under the US dollar chart, start extrapolating into some setups. Risk disclaimer part one, trading is risky. I'm going to leave this up for 15 seconds. If you're not familiar with it, please do familiarize yourself with it. And then we'll move on to the next disclaimer. And 15 seconds by my watch. Disclaimer part two, hypothetical trading disclaimer. We're going to look at some past trades. We're going to look at some strategy. Anytime we do that, we have to know past performance is not indicative of future results. And here we go. So as mentioned, that US dollar move is really beginning to get pretty interesting, right? Um, so to, again, put this into proper context, here's the election night reversal. Here's the bullish move as the dollar ran up to 14 year highs. And you know, even as this was happening, it was already looking a little bit dicey just by how quickly it had run so aggressively, right? I mean, it was on the night of the election that the US dollar, as represented here by DXY, had just tipped down to catch support of a really long-term level at 95.86. This is the 50% Fibonacci retracement of this very long-term 14 plus year move. Well, the move itself took seven years, but we haven't broken above or below since. See 101.80, the 618 Fib retracement. Caught a little bit of resistance on the way up, but when we did finally throttle above that, it kind of felt as though the dollar was starting to live on borrowed time. Uh, we had the second rate hike in the past 10 years right here on December 16th. Notice we did set a new high shortly after the open of the new year, but much of that January price action was aggressively bearish. Notice how we retraced almost 60% of that prior move, and that's taken the election night lows which was a fairly outsized reversal. But again, throughout January, just as we were looking at the fact that the US dollar might have overshot to the upside here, we were looking at the prospect of the dollar having overshot to the downside in the aftermath. Okay, Because what had driven this thing in the second half of Q4 was that combination of a ready, willing, and able central bank, i.e. a Federal Reserve that was still very cautious, very careful, and now it was com combined with the prospect of fiscal stimulus, of economic policies being passed through Congress that could take over the whole growth equation two, three, maybe even five, ten years down the road. So we had that coalescent backdrop driving price action to these 14-year highs. And then throughout January, as this retracement began, notice it started in a rather tepid manner, even caught some support here off the 38.2. But that 
backdrop, I began to see a lot more questions. One of those questions was often regarding the president and his take on the quote-unquote strong dollar policy. And as this retracement lasted for much of January, again, erasing about 60% of that prior move, we finally saw bulls return in the early portion of February. Now, this has produced a relatively consistent trend channel, as, as denoted right here in red. Okay. Notice we have a couple of inflections on the upside, a couple on the down. What's really interesting to me is this midline where price actions kind of appear to have a, almost a degree of magnetic polarity attached to it. Now, this morning gave a catapult to this move around Janet Yellen's testimony in front of Congress. I think the big line that caught everybody's attention was in her prepared remarks in which she said it was better to hike rates sooner rather than later. And this got a lot of attention because we saw the odds for a hike in March increase quite a bit. Earlier this morning, it was at 30%. As Ms. Yellen was speaking, it went up to 36%. I know it only sounds like 6 percentage points of difference, but on a 30 base, that's a 20% increase in those March expectations. And so you can see where the dollar caught a quick bid, ran up. And even while she was speaking during that testimony, notice how resistance had started to hold in here. We have four different hourly wicks while cutting through this 101.35 area. Okay, so what we have here is the potential for a new bullish theme to begin developing as essentially resurgence of the prior or what I call the predominant move. I call this a predominant move because we still stayed within within the move during the retracement. The reasons for the move continued to exist. And now we can see where bulls appear to be coming back into the equation. We just popped above this swing high, right around 101. Now this level had been fairly important. Notice of that January retracement, I'm going to take the high up here on January 3rd, take it down to the low here at the open of February. And notice that the 38.2% Fibonacci retracement of that move comes in right at that 101 level. More interesting to me than that was how sellers have continually offered at this level. Notice these numerous recurrences of where bulls were trying to drive it above, but bears just weren't having any of it. They were using this to close up positions, maybe even open new positions. But it wasn't until this morning that we got the ammo to finally burst above that, that, that batch of resistance. Now, it's still pretty early in this theme because we haven't yet retraced 50% of the January bearish move. Once we take that out, I'll be a lot more confident on dollar strength sustainability over the next couple of months. But until this is taken out, I'm still going to keep in mind how aggressive this January retracement came in. And the fact that these variables that have been driving price action higher, they could continue to shift. For instance, tomorrow, we get day two of Cherry Owens' testimony. Now, fully realizing that Janet Yellen is in a very difficult spot here because she can't get too aggressive on rate hike prospects. She also can't get too passive. I think we want to keep in mind what happened last year on the S&P where we did see a marked change between day one and day two of that testimony. Uh, same type of thing last year. Day one of that testimony was here on February 10th. Day two was on February 11th. Now, I remember this really well because the S&P set a new low just before running into a long-term reversal that lasted for the rest of the year. I mean, it technically is still lasting, right? At election night, or excuse me, the Humphrey Hawkins February low down here at 1807. Quite a ways away from where we're at now, over 500 points. Now, what happened here was really very interesting, and I think that this does model to a degree with what we have right now. This was the first rate hike in nine years, uh, excuse me, it's right here, December 16th. So we got that first rate hike in nine years. And notice the next two weeks, things stayed relatively stable. But when posing that hike, the Fed also said that they saw a full four hikes in 2016. Now, that was already something that was caught with quite a bit of skepticism. I mean, for a central bank that's just spent the last eight years on near zero rates, 
on dovish, loose policy options. I think there were very few investors that bought the idea that the Fed was going to actually hike a full four times in 2016. But nonetheless, their message was well received. They wanted a normalized policy. And with stock prices hanging near all-time high still, having recovered from that August swoon, there wasn't a huge reason for a sell-off, at least until the beginning of the year, and this is when Chinese markets began to implode again. And now you look at this more vulnerable backdrop with the Fed wanting to hike a full four times in 2016. At the time, oil prices were just getting crushed. And now you have the new risk factor of China. And, and in pretty quick order, U.S. markets began to put in collapse-like moves. I say collapse-like moves. I mean, we were seeing limit down instances before, before the open a couple of different times. And that led into Janet Yellen's Humphrey Hawkins testimony right down here. Now, on day one of that testimony, February 10th, she was directly asked, what is the Fed's opinion on negative rates? Because you got to remember, at this point in time, we just had that one rate hike. We were at 50 basis points Fed funds. That one rate hike happened just before equity markets began to collapse. So she was somewhat on the hot seat. Now, her response on day one was, we investigated negative rates. We don't even know if that's legal. Now, while negative rates might not be a huge concern today, it's the fact that the Fed is willing to do new things in the effort of supporting markets that I think was most well received. And that happened on day two. She was asked the same exact question, but offered a markedly different response on day two. On day two, she said, there's no options that we are going to take off the table. And as you can see, that led into a really robust reversal. Now, middle of March, next Fed meeting with the press conference, the Fed backed away from that four rate hike mantra. Notice the stock prices continued to fly. That ran all the way into Brexit. Now, when Brexit happened, big source of concern, right? We saw two days of selling and then the realization that central banks probably weren't going to stand idly by and let markets collapse began to really permeate throughout the world. It showed up here in the S&P. It showed up in the UK, in, uh, in the FTSE. And we saw stock prices run even higher. And then that election night reversal was even quicker, even more aggressive, and lasted has lasted quite a bit longer, right? Because the night of the election, you see stock prices spilling over, but we'd even said so at the time when it was appearing as though a, a Trump win was correlated with equity weakness. That didn't change anything about the Federal Reserve stance, their recent pattern of being passive, and their effort of supporting equity markets. That finally got us to a place where we were able to get that second rate hike right there, that second rate hike in 10 years. And this time, the Fed said they were looking at three rate hikes in 2017, not four, as they had done last year, but three. Still aggressive, but given that we now have the prospect of fiscal stimulus, fiscal policy taking over the growth equation in the United States, the Fed may have had a little bit more room to operate with a little additional hawkishness. Now, the problem is the markets still aren't buying it. They're taking the Fed's actions over the past 10 years, and the fact they have been passive and have biased on caution, and it appears as though they're still expecting that. So even though the Fed says they're looking at three hikes this year, markets are only expecting two. Ms. Yellen's commentary today helped get that a little bit closer to three, with odds on March increasing now to 36%. I think they had tipped down to 34 but still a bit higher from this morning's 30% read. So where this comes to roost is the fact that if we are seeing this theme coming back into markets, there could be a lot of room to operate on numerous pairs, numerous trade setups. A couple of different ways of playing this dollar move right now. Now, I don't want to chase this just after we've had uh, effectively what's been a stimulant to the setup, right? Yellen's commentary today shot this up to new highs. Just a little bit shy of this 50% fib retracement but I don't want to buy this thing while we were at a new high. We have the zone of resistance, prior resistance, that become a very novel area of next support. Come down on the hourly chart. And you can see where we had worked with price action around here. We have the spike high of around 101.11. 
I have this price action low around 100 spot 89. So what I could do is I could create myself a little zone here to look for a support check in the Asian session, or European session, ahead of tomorrow. In the effort of buying support on the dollar in front of Yellen's commentary tomorrow. So let's outline that zone right now. I know it's kind of a chunky zone, and that's okay. I'm using it as a chunky zone because I have a couple of areas that I'd feel a little bit better about stop placement if I could get it a little bit deeper here. Uh, that area optimally would be right around here. Probably want to get it below that 100 spot 50 marker. There was a gap in there. If I get it below that 100 spot 50 marker, I'd feel a lot better about it. If I did want to keep it tighter, there is a little batch of price action swings right in here that I might be able to use. But if I could get that higher low support right within the zone, I feel a lot better about long dollar accumulation. Another way of looking at this is that 101.53 level that's just above current price action. That's the 50 fib of the January retracement. If we break above that, then I would look at this January retracement as at that point being negated. At that point, I'd feel a little bit better about the prospect of chasing if I could find it on the right pair. I wouldn't want to chase it in isolation. I'd still want to do something like I'm doing now, wait for support so that I can control my risk, look to buy a higher low in the effort of trend continuation of the bigger picture or predominant theme. Now, one of the more opportune areas, in my opinion, to look for such a theme is right here in the dollar yen. And notice that we have some pretty interesting text happening right now. We are very near a resistance level. The 23.6 of that Trump bump, taking the election night low. Look at this double top January or December 15th, then again on January 3rd. Now, what I really like about dollar yen here, and uh, give me a second, let me get the right one. There we go. What I really like about dollar yen here is that when we did get that January retracement, remember how we were looking at the US dollar in isolation? And it was showing about a, a ballpark 60% move lower. Uh, Dan asked, what do you mean by chasing in isolation? If I was uh, trading just the DXY chart, right? Because if I'm trading just the DXY chart, this is just the dollar. If I'm looking at dollar yen, well, now it's the dollar combined with the Japanese yen. So a slight difference, but there's going to be a lot of carryover there. But remember how we were looking at that move on DXY in January, it wiped out like over 50%, nearing 60% of the Trump bump. Dollar yen didn't cut that deep. Dollar yen gave us what I consider to be a fairly attractive 38.2% retracement, which could be a sign of a healthy trend. And so Dan, to kind of illustrate my earlier point, given that the dollar in isolation had cut 50% of that Trump bump move right in here, and the dollar yen only cut around 38.2% of that move. Well, this would denote that this setup held up a little bit better because we also had the additional impetus of yen weakness, right? So if I'm going to look to buy dollars, that's how I want to do it. I want to pair it up with something that has shown an additional amount of weakness that could make the, the paired setup a little bit more attractive than the isolated setup. Now, we're in... <laughs> kind of a weird little box area here on dollar yen. I say a weird little box, and I'm looking at these two levels between uh, two roughly rounded figures. Ah, there we go. Look at that kiss off resistance. 114 and a half. Now, uh, let me show you where these levels come from because uh, it is it is rather relevant, in my opinion. Okay, so that big reversal or that big support hit we had right back here earlier February look at the way that price action on the daily chart spent like three days trying to break through but buyers continue to show up right buyers continue to show up here now this level is a long-term fib level it's the 50% fib of this major move You're taking the top in 1998 to the bottom in 2011 Notice that 50 fib is right here at 111 spot 613. Did a great job of catching the lows three consecutive days about a week ago. Now the secondary move also of relevance 
I'm taking the 2002 top down to that same 2011 low. And the 618 of that move is right here at 112.40. Now we're going to get a little bit tighter with these near-term levels, the box that I was referring to. The 23.6% retracement of the Abinomics move is right here at 114. That's what was giving us resistance this morning. That's what dollar yen broke through after this yelling commentary. And that's what I want to now look for at, at support. There's one other level of relevance. That's the one showing up as resistance right now. That's the 23.6% retracement of that Trump bump move. Let's go down a little tighter. Daily chart, there we go. Oh, even tighter. Four hours. Okay. So there's that January retracement. Again, cut a bit more shallow than what we saw on DXY. Now, after price action, it popped back up to that 23.6%. As the sellers came in, right, and it wasn't until Yellen's commentary today that we were finally able to break up to new highs. So now at this point, on this four-hour chart, I have the prospect of a higher high after a new higher low. But we're at resistance. If I want to buy it, I want to buy it at support. And I still have a little bit of a zone to work with here. Let's get a little tighter. Hourly chart. Okay, so first let's work the underside of the setup. Okay, so I look at this as like an S1, this is like an S2, and this is like an S3. Okay, I want to get my stops below one of these levels. This one's probably going to be a little too wide for what I want to do. These two are quite a bit more workable, in my opinion. This one especially, it's just about 120, 130 pips off. Uh, but that's current price. Okay, I want to see this come back down. Look at this prior zone of resistance right in here. And again, if I could catch that as support, well, now I could look at a tighter stop below this prior swing in the effort of that trend continuation, right? So that as long as this respects that cycle of higher highs and higher lows, and it does not break below the prior higher low, I could stay alive in the long position. If I wanted to give it a little bit more room, I could try to squeeze that down here below this 112.75 area. But this, to me, seems like a very novel area to look for, that next support. Again, I don't want to dial it up. It's just a hard and rigid line. Price action is like humanity. It's not perfect. It's not perfect. But I could take a zone like this, right? Like right around 114.05, give or take, down about 113.85. Be a nice little 20 pip zone to look for support and the effort of buying it so that I get a stop below the prior, looking for that extension move higher. The aspect of this setup that I really do like is, you know, some of these geopolitical underpinnings that are behind this trade, right? Now, I know that a lot of the world is focused on Trump right now. I think one of the few comments that I've seen that can maybe be related to markets would be... Um, the comments that came out, I think it was over a couple of days ago, uh, where Trump essentially approved of Shinzo Abe's economic policies, right? And this is coming from a source that's previously condemned China, uh, Europe, Germany, uh, uh, against those same policies. So the fact that this may have some type of implied or maybe even inferred uh, support from the U.S., I think that could be beneficial to a longer-term bout of yen weakness. And then just, again, combine that with the fact that the reality of the matter showed us a, a more shallow retracement here on dollar yen. That yen weakness it still existed, even though the yen was relatively strong over January. I say relatively strong, given the fact that it did strengthen against the dollar, yen, uh, or excuse me, uh, euro, pound, etc. So that's the first setup I want to look at for today: dollar strength continuation. Looking at dollar yen. Uh, another one. This is a little less clear to me. A little less clean. But nonetheless, there's some interesting stuff going on here with uh, Euro dollar. <clears throat> now, up until the past couple days, I was of the opinion that a longer term reversal might be showing up in the Euro. And I was essentially taking this from just deductive analysis, just real simple stuff. So European QE didn't actually start until right here, right near the lows. But ever since European QE was on board, the euro dollar developed into this nice little bear flag formation.
Now in December, we got another throw of QE from the ECB, and that finally broke through some of these support levels to give us a new, I believe this was like an eight-year low. But yeah, I brought on a fresh low here, a level that we hadn't seen since, yeah, even longer, 2002. But again, uh, you know, the deductive part of this was the fact that once we did break through support, right back here, well, right back there, ECB and then Fed, once we did break through support after that one-two combo of the ECB and then the Fed, it stopped going lower. Bears just really dried up, and that parity figure was in sight. You know, it was 340 pips away. But bears dried up, and we started to see this bullish price action. And this was after, you know, basically the ECB and the Fed throwing, you know, the proverbial kitchen sink at the matter in December. So to me, it was looking as though the euro dollar was going to go into a bullish type of setup after a little bit of noise or congestion. And, and that's what appeared to be showing up in January. Higher highs, higher lows, relatively consistent. But what's made this really daunting, in my opinion, is the fact that it has not been able to hold support as the dollar has been surging throughout February. We've just broken back down through that bear flag formation, through the trend line on the underside of that bear flag. After traders had tried to offer support there, then it came in as resistance. Now the 50 fib of that bullish move throughout throughout January is right here at 105.85, and we broke through that with some strength this morning. All right, you can see where buyers had tried to hold this up right back here, even gotten us that resistance hit off the underside of that bear flag, and the sellers just just crushed this thing lower. I say crush, it's about 100 pip run. But what I want to watch for here is this zone of prior support. Notice all of these wicks that came in here, right? And you can almost see where price action is trying to churn here. You can see, I mean, you can see sellers reacting to these moves higher, right? As indicated by these topside wicks. But bulls were just like a hard line of support, right? Right here, right, right around 105.95 for whatever reason. Right, you see all those wicks, 1, 2, 3, 4, 5, 6, 7, 8, 9, 10, 11, 12. 12 straight hours they tried to break through, just couldn't do it. Now the same type of thing starting to show up right now, this is we were looking at on the US dollar and the dollar yen. After that uh, yellow inspired move, we have some traders that are closing up positions, maybe even looking to play a bullish reversal. But what's really interesting to me is this zone between 105.85 in this area where all of these buyers had previously tried to offer support, just weren't able to do it. So if I can catch resistance in that area, right in here, all right, you see all that support. If I can catch resistance in that area, I like the idea of looking for a short side continuation trade. Now there is another side to this, another aspect of this, and that is SSI. Um, I noticed that as we had some of these support breaks, buyers really started to show up. Uh, via SSI, and you know this is one of those things where I think uh, you know retail is trying to catch a range when when we could have the proclivity to move into a trend. Uh, you know, as far as like a parity test or something, I don't know if, my, if it's going to cut that deep, um, but I think from a bearish trend standpoint, what we're seeing right now on price actions, pretty encouraging. So I want to look for resistance in this 15, 20 pip zone, and yeah, for a plain continuation. All right, so I got a couple of, of weak dollar plays as well. I um, wanted to touch on this one first. I'm relatively neutral on this because it hasn't really shown me much today. Now, I'm of the mind that a lot of what we're seeing on uh, Fed rate high concerns is filtering through here in gold, right? As in when the Fed is hawkish, looking to hike rates, normalize policy, that's been a big hit to gold prices. And, and we can see that playing out throughout the Trump bump. Night of the election, gold had gotten up to, I think it was like 1337. And then just like four, five weeks later, down here at 1122. Didn't quite retrace 50% of that move, right? Notice, as a matter of fact, near-term support's coming in right at 1220, right off the 382 of that move, right? So still, same thing as what I was looking at in dollar yen 
I would not want to uh, chase this to the upside yet, the very least until this level is taken out. But what is encouraging on that front is the sellers try to take it down for a support revisit earlier today when not able to make it. We saw buyers come right back in. I'm of the mind that if this was a legitimate you know, long-term dollar shift, this would have already broken through support. It just hasn't happened yet. So there might be something else going on. Yet another reason I want to keep some of these short dollar setups on the radar, even when it looks like trend continuation is coming back. Now, if I do want to trade this to the upside, I'd want a better price. When we have a swing like this, there's likely, likely going to be quite a few stops underneath here. If that could break, it could clear out some of those stops. And we have another support zone, support level down here at 1215. This level that offered some resistance back here in January. A little bit of support, a little bit of resistance on the way down in November. But there you, know, you can see that resistance showing up in January. But if I could get it below this low, yet above this support level, then it might be open for a bullish reversal type of setup. Oh, and uh, Steve, yeah, we give away SSI in a, a lot of different venues. Um, so to anybody that is looking for SSI, give me one moment and I'll get you a quick link. Uh, let me just set that up. It's going to take us a quick second. Yeah, and on most of my reports, I include a link to SSI right up here. Like right down here. So yeah, this one was updated uh, just a couple hours ago. Uh, but I'm going to put this in the chat box for anybody so interested. Uh, but just right there, you could favorite that, come back whenever uh, whenever convenient. So yeah, before you know, calling the dogs on a long-term bullish dollar thing, I want to see this break through that 12.15 level. If it doesn't, then I like the idea of bullish reversal prospects here on gold. Um, you know, maybe up to like a 12.40 level, 12.50. I don't know. A little more difficult to say on uh, targets just yet. Okay, now on the front of dollar weakness, uh, another one that I think is fairly interesting is right here. Um, now, I've been unabashedly bullish on sterling for a while now, and we had another, well, I had another reminder as to why this morning with UK inflation. I don't think we've even started to see the beginning of that saga yet. I think that's that plot's going to thicken throughout the second half of this year. Um, Nonetheless, just a little bit of comparative analysis between what's going on here and what's going on in the euro, I think, could denote uh, why dollar weakness might be a little bit more attractive here. And that's essentially in the fact that we are not bursting down to new lows right now. We set this low on cable mid in mid-January. Right after that low came in, this is when we had Theresa May's Brexit speech and then the UK Supreme Court ruling. And this was, again, combined with that backdrop of a weak dollar throughout January. Now, the early portion of February looked as though that dollar strength was really going to show up very vividly here against uh, against the sterling. It didn't quite pan out like that. We caught a decent reversal here, came right back, and now you can see where price action appears to be working with these FIB levels, as it has been. This, this FIB is uh, very simple, just taking the high from September 22nd, taking that down to the low of January 15th. And notice recent battle resistance came in right here at the 50 fib. Now, if we could break above that 50 fib, we'll feel a lot better about, about topside continuation prospects. But we don't have that right now. What we have is we have price action just coming off of a level that had been prior support right down here on the hourly chart. So this is still be maybe a little bit dicey, considering that we've already left support a little bit. I don't really have a great or a valid reason to know why this came in, I feel a lot better about 24.18. But I could essentially try to trade a range with a trend side bias on a shorter term chart. And what I mean by that is if I know that I want to use this zone or this area for, for a stop, I could use that to kind of reverse or back into my trade. Let me show you what I mean. 
Okay, if I know I want my stop below this batch of support, I can do uh, one of these. 24, 29, nice uneven number. Now if I'm gonna use 24, 29, it's ballpark, 43-ish pips of uh, risk given current price, I don't include spread, commission, anything like that. Now if I'm gonna look for 43 of risk, I wanna see about 86 potential upside if this is, uh, to make this worth my while. Now 86 on top of 24, 72 gives me 25, 58 just above this level of resistance. Right up here. That gets me one, two. I don't like that. I want it to be right here inside of these highs. 25.38. Okay, so if I'm gonna use 25.38, it's only gonna give me about 66 of upside, meaning I could use 33 of, of underneath just to look for my one, two. 2439 is what I'd need to get that one two risk order ratio. I, I think that could be workable. That is something that I'm not not too petrified of. Yeah, it could be workable. Essentially trying to play a range with the trend side bias. Uh, but more so than anything else is, again, one of those dollar weakness plays as a way of looking to hedge off some of this long dollar risk I'm taking on elsewhere. <laughs> okay, another area where I could look for some dollar weakness right here in the Kiwi. Uh, now the Kiwi is just absolutely spilled over. Um, we were looking at this level around 73 and three quarters, uh, 73 and three quarters right here uh, for a while. Notice how that came in as a really aggressive point of reverse right around the beginning of February. But again, look at all these wicks, right? In the same way that we were looking at that, I believe it was a euro dollar chart just a minute ago on the hourly, the same type of themes can play out on these daily charts, although it's probably going to be a little more powerful given there's more opinions behind this, there's more eyeballs that have seen it, etc. But nonetheless, uh, I had kept this trend line on my chart because it had appeared to cut some really interesting intraday price action, like right down here. And I mean, a real simple trend line. Uh, point of origination right here July 20th, point of touch here on uh, October 2nd, excuse me, October 12th. And like I was saying, it cut really nicely with a lot of intraday price action. So I just kept it on my chart to see what would happen when we revisit. All right, intraday, this is hourly, quick, quick hourly. Lo and behold, we come back. Notice how it's resistance, then support. Uh, showing back up, which could be resistance, but we've got to see the way that this thing is going to work for the rest of the day. But here, if you look at this on the daily, you can see where that wick is cutting underneath that trend line. Now, if this holds, and if I begin to see bullish price action on the hourly four-hour chart, I could look at this as a reversal type of prospect. Stop underneath this low. I'd feel even better if I could get it below the low of 71. The same kind of deal. I want to make sure that I could comfortably look for a one-two risk reward ratio before I have any interest to in trying to enter this position. But I can look for this to play back 72. And look at these underside wicks, 72.41, 72.42. And then even if I run it a little bit deeper, right up here about this 73 level. I would want to manage off most of my risk before we get back to 73 and three quarters. Oh, excuse me, 73.37. Now, if we do get there, I'm not too bashful about keeping on a fifth of the lot to look for a topside break. But I don't want to keep on more than 20% of my overall position when we get back up to this resistance zone that has been just very, very imposing. So that's another dollar weakness setup. And uh, sticking in that area of the world of Oceania, um, Aussie dollar. Now, this is a pair that's been rather perplexing to me of recent, but I'm of the mind that this is a longer term type of shakeout. Like if we look at this on the monthly variety, you'll notice that basically since like March last year, this has essentially just been in a choppy range on this monthly chart. But what's really interesting to me is, yep, there's those wicks. Look at the way that this zone of resistance is set in here on the Aussie since like March of last year, right? 
like we have not had a monthly close above, I think right here about 70, right around 76 and a half. Right, we're in that, kind of that danger zone right now. Now if the weekly chart, we can see last week's doji. Run off that same zone of resistance. Look at all those wicks. Sellers, sellers, sellers. So when I see this type of stuff, this is where I get really, really, uh, I feel really vulnerable if I'm holding any long exposure, right? Because you've seen the market's proclivity to bring in sellers when we're in the zone. And sure, we could break through. I don't like the idea of holding risk, hoping that it breaks through, though. If I want to be long, I'm going to wait for it to break, and then I'll look to load up. Or if I want to be short, let it start to break down, then look to to take the other side or the, or the short side of the move. Uh, down here on a daily chart though, this is where it starts, this is where a timing variable begins to, to come in here. Uh, so notice after we came to this resistance zone, sellers have been coming back, right? Buyers have, they've persisted around the 76 level, right? So you can see where we're kind of like boxing in here. Let's go down a little bit tighter. There we go. All right, there's that support hit just earlier today. Here I can look for this batch of prior resistance, new support to give way before looking at the short side of the move. And the effort to play in the longer term multi-month range to fill in the pair lower. Now kind of the same thing with Kiwi at 7337, that hard line zone of resistance that's just continued to hold. We have a similar type of deal taking place here on the Aussie around 72. 7184 is a fib, 7204 is a fib. Uh, Notice here there are two different recurrences where extremely bearish price action ran right into that zone of support each time reversal. Now in many of these cases, the third time could be the charm. As in if we do see one of these imminent breaks to come down and retest this level, my expectation is that we'd see a dash of support, but the bearish move would not necessarily be dead just because buyers begin to show up here. But at the very least, I want to include this as a pivotal part of any type of profit-taking exercises that I want to do on a longer-term position that I'm looking to play out here on these monthly variables, right? Uh, as in, same type of thing that I was looking at on the Kiwi, where I'd want to uh, manage off at least about 80% of the position once we get to that widely watched zone of support for fear that it does reverse again. At least that way, I don't have to take a reversal on the entire lot or 50% of the lot. But if I'm going to play a breakout, I'm essentially looking for a outsized move with a small amount of risk, right? But if I could keep 20% of the lot on, if we can get down to a support revisit, I like the idea of looking for that break on that third time, trying to test this level. And that, my friends, is what I have for today. I uh, want to see what kind of questions you have. Uh, please don't hesitate to ask me anything trading related. Um, of course, there has been uh, some news events taking place over the last week. Unfortunately, there's some stuff I'm just not going to be able to comment on. I just don't know enough about it yet. Um, I was in Iceland last week when all this stuff was happening. It, uh, it was shocking, to say the least. From Dan M., um, that was the chasing and isolation question uh, mentioned a little bit earlier. And the reason that I'll try to cut these things up uh, as I did a little bit earlier, right? Like I took a look at the dollar and then took a look at dollar yen and I said, well, hey, dollar yen has been a little bit more bullish than just dollar in absentia. Um, I think that it helps to just really illustrate how the two-sided nature of a currency pair could be really helpful in, in trend-based analysis, you know, because essentially there's two themes that I have working on any of these setups, right? If it's a long dollar yen, well, I'm trading strong dollar weak yen, right? As long as one of those themes is prominent, at least more so than the opposite of the other, uh, it should show me topside movement. As in, if yen weakness is the real big vogue, even if the dollar is strong, I could still be okay. Um, you know, kind of the reverse. Even if the yen is relatively strong, and say the euro against sterling, if if the dollar is really really strong, well, then I could still be okay. You know, so I look at it from a vantage point of probabilities, where you know I think it's you know, it's possible to look at a chart like this, the U.S. dollar, and, and, you know, trade it in a vacuum. You know, this is what I did with stocks for a very long time before I ever found pairings or FX or anything. But, you know, much more preferable to me is being able to coalesce a couple of different themes into the same type of thing 
and uh, maybe get a couple of other factors working in my favor as well. Uh, from Lanier, can this dollar yen retracement be considered a zigzag which has ended? I think it can. Uh, I don't remember the, the textbook definition of a zigzag. I don't really trade with those. Um, the thing with zigzag that I do remember is that it's always, I believe it's always, I believe it's repainted, and it's always late. So, you know, with a lot of these indicators, when I was learning that type of stuff, um, I would try to reverse engineer it. I'd first try to find out where does it break down? Where does it fail? Because almost every indicator does, right? Because it's just an indication. It's just, um, you know, when I teach my friends how to trade or when I talk to my friends about trading, the way that I tell them or teach them about indicators is it's it's kind of like a, like a 3D viewer scope, right? You put on the goggles and you see a slightly different refracted view of the world. Does that necessarily mean it's a better view of the world? No. It's just washed with a mathematical equation. It's kind of the same thing with indicators, right? Like RSI could be a really great indicator. It could also be really lousy. Um, but, you know, there's there's few indicators that I know of that are just pure value add. There's usually downside to some degree on most of them. Um, and that's why I like to just cut the chase and go straight to price action because it is what it is. It, it, it never purports to tell you anything other than what is happening now. And then, you know, it could help me focus a little bit more on the present tense as opposed to what I need to do now for what might happen in the future. You know, the, the longer that I traded, the more I wanted to, I guess, kind of get straight to the source, if you will, um, you know, without indicators or, or uh, any of that stuff. Um, but Jeremy had a really good session on ZigZag earlier today, and I'm, I'm sure he's probably got the, the recording up by now on, uh, on YouTube. Uh, but check out our YouTube feed if you want a little bit more about ZigZag. Uh, from Dan M, like Dollar Cad has to worry about the Cad and oil fundamentals. Yeah, exactly, right? You know, Dollar Cad is going to be a little bit different because, um, you know, the Canadian economy is a lot smaller than the U.S. economy. You know, so if, if a pound for pound matter kind of happens, uh, it's going to be more, more relevant to Dollar Cad based on what's happening in the U.S. just because of the size of the economies. Whereas dollar yen, Japan, U.S. is a little more closely aligned. Uh, I believe Japan's about half of the U.S. economy, maybe a little bit less. Um, you know, they're third, China two, U.S. one, as far as national. Uh, including the euro, it would be uh, euro, U.S., China, Japan. Yeah, I completely agree, Steve. <laughs> Hans said, uh, oh, you were in Iceland? Great. I'm actually from Iceland. Oh, man. I am so jealous. Um, that is probably one of the coolest places I've ever been. I was just in love with Iceland. And it rained the whole time I was there. I basically went to take pictures of uh, the Aurora Borealis, and it was raining all week. But uh, <laughs> I, I didn't care. I had a great time. Um, Saw so Gulfoss, Old Geyser, Blue Lagoon. It was, uh, it was an amazing, amazing place. You know, and what was really interesting was the case study on economics, right? Because Iceland went through a full financial collapse in 2008. They did not get a bank bailout. And, you know, as opposed to Iceland, you know, kind of trying to kick the can down the road, it seemed like Icelandic voters got really ticked off, you know, <laughs> they basically had a you know a full full sweep of uh, that parliament there, right? And uh, and and revitalized the economy. I mean, amazingly. It, just this morning, uh, seeing I think it was GDP growth nearing like ten percent. It's just uh, it's just really insane, in a good way, in a good way. Um, Han said, yeah, I almost ran out of eggs. Oh, yeah, that was one of the things that I did notice is, uh, is, is the purchasing power parity. You know, a big difference, big, big difference. Um, you know, uh, Iceland, a big thing, there's hot dogs, right? I stopped and, and got a hot dog on, like, the big stand right there in the middle of Reykjavik. And, uh, <laughs> you know, I was doing the math, and I think the exchange rate when I went was, like, every dollar was 113 kroner. And... Uh, 
a hot dog was, I think it was 850, 850 kroner. And so I did the math and it was like, man, that's, that's like seven bucks. <laughs> New York, it's like three. Uh, Hans said, just like Bill Clinton. Yes, sir. Same exact one that uh, Mr. Clinton was at. Yes, sir. Um, Falaran says, uh, thank you for that statement on indicators. To me, price action tells you all you really need to know. Yeah, you know, I mean, and, and I don't want to besmirch anybody's approach. I think I'm, I'm you know, I always try to be very uh, upfront in the fact and saying I don't have the only way of doing things here. I definitely don't. Um, but, you know, indicators can be helpful in some ways, you know, and, and uh, a, a couple of the guys that I work with, you know, they have really interesting ways of using them. Like one is the, the 200 DMA, right? So here I'll show you like some of my favorite parts of indicators since I just uh, said some not overly positive stuff on them. Um, but yeah, you could throw in like a 200 day moving average and <laughs> see, so like on dollar cad, for instance, I would have caught these whips. I would have seen these whips. I'd have been like, I know something's there. I don't know what, well, it's a 200 day moving average. Right? Now, the reason that I don't follow this you know, heavily is because it doesn't work all the time. And so if there's any error in the underlying foundation, I kind of look at it like building a house. You know, if there's a, you know, if there's a problem in the foundation, the rest of the house is not stable. If I'm going to build my analysis off of this stuff, you know, I at least want to know that, hey, this was a jumbled period. Something strange was happening here. If I'm just following it off the 200 DMA. It's going to be a lot harder for me to do that. Um, but you can catch some pretty interesting trades off of things like this. Like if, you, if you're following this 200 DMA, if you see a wick cut through it, and then you see another wick cut through it with a higher low and another wick cut through it with another higher low, you know, that could be a good evidence of buyers responding to a 200 DMA cross, you know, that could lead to something at the very least a way of concentrating risk, keeping it relatively light. And, uh, you know, like I was doing a little earlier, trying to plot a one, two risk reward ratio. And there's a reason for the one, two as well. I'm, I'm not expecting that I'm going to get a hundred percent more, uh, upside than, than, than risk outlay on every one of these setups. That's that's definitely not the point. The point here is 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 to try to get um, operating room, working room, if you will. As in, if I plot for a one two risk reward ratio, and if I don't hit it, even if I get a one to one point five or a one to one point two five, I'm still batting better than a one to one. At you know, at at the at the end of the year, I want to see my risk reward ratio better than a one to one. Because I don't want to expect myself to have to win more than 50% of the time on anything. And one easy way of offsetting that necessity of being right more than half the time is bigger wins versus losses. Now, I just know from experience, if I line these setups up with a 1-1 one -one or a 1-1.5 one and I have to sit here and watch a limit get hit just to reinforce my risk reward, I'm not going to be comfortable. I'm going to start messing with the approach and I'm going to start doing things that I probably shouldn't do. Discipline is highly, highly, highly overrated. It's necessary. But, you know, this desire that people have to want to force themselves into these Skinner box situations where they have to be disciplined, you're setting yourself up for failure, right? As in, if I know that watching politics makes me place bad trades, I'm just not going to watch politics. I don't need to ha sit there and have the discipline of having the TV on but the mute button, you know, trying to read the subtitles, figuring out what's going on. No, I don't want to put myself in that situation. I'll just avoid it. And, you know, I think it could be like that with indicators where you could kind of create your own reality, if you will. And I think that that's over the long term, in my opinion, the best way of going about it because at the end of the day, it's yours. You own that approach. <laughs> One said uh, they almost ran out of eggs, throwing them at the parliament building. <laughs> Um, I met a, a gentleman there, um, a well, friend I met up with, and he said uh, when that happened, there were 30,000 protesters right there at Parliament in Reykjavik. And as scope, there's only 300,000 residents in Iceland, so 10% of the country came out to protest. Um, I know, I take it back, that was the Panama Papers. <laughs> so, but yeah, 10% of the population protested the Panama Papers. It was amazing. So cool. Um, yeah. Oh, and uh, Dan M, excellent point of emphasis here. Uh, Jeremy earlier was talking about zigzag pattern in Elliott wave analysis, not the zigzag indicator. All right, sorry about that. Let me see if we have anything on uh, daily effects on zigzag.
All right, so I see another one from Jeremy. Uh, oh yeah, so he'll isolate and just talk about some some zigzag absent of Elliott wave in here. I believe I don't really have time to get uh, to get into the uh, read the full article here, but uh, but I, th I think that could could help with where you're looking to go. Hey, all good, Steve. All good, my friend. Really appreciate it. Um, but uh, yes, sir, I will have the YouTube archive up probably in about 30 minutes or so. I gotta, you know, let the video finalize and upload all that good stuff. But uh, I'll definitely have it on there um, uh, as quickly as possible. But uh, folks, we're completely out of time for today. Um, I just want to thank everybody very much for your time. I really do appreciate it. Um, if you have any additional questions, please don't hesitate to let us know. Um, if it's not here on the webinar next Thursday, I'm always happy to help you ladies and gentlemen out over Twitter uh, when, whenever possible. Um, but I'm available right here, that smiling bloke. <laughs> um, I'm going to put that in the chat box. Just let me know if there's any way I can help you out. But uh, thank you so much for your time. I hope you have a great rest of the day. I'll be back on Thursday and I uh, hope to see each of you, each of you then. Uh, but until then, as always, happy trading, ladies and gentlemen.